And, and so, again, you know, those equivalencies are, are difficult. The second thing has to do with euphemisms. And every culture has euphemisms for certain aspects of life. Usually, sex and matters of toilet. Right? You have things that you say to talk about those things when you have to talk about them instead of actually physically describing what is going to be taking place. Because right? there's, there's some issues of what is acceptable in pub and, and polite company, let's say. Now, the same kind of things took place in the Hebrew, the Greek, right? the Bible. The Bible talks about matters of sex, matters of the toilet. And so there are these euphemisms. So what do you do when you come across these things in the Bible? And you're, you're trying to translate them, right? You're reading the Hebrew. Do you put it in the literal idiom and leave everybody guessing? So, for example, Genesis chapter 4. Adam knew his wife. Sorry. Of course he's known her. She's been around since chapter 2. How could he not know her? No, 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 no. Adam... Adam knew his wife. Yeah, he's known her all night. Oh, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. You mean, oh, you mean know his wife. When we talk about those kind of things, we don't talk about, you know, oh, did you hear that he knew his wife and they had a child? We only use that because the Bible uses that. So if you, you, and that's just a simple one. Some suggest the idea of, of covering and uncovering feet has to do with genitals. Right? It's not talking about your literal feet, it has to talk, it's talking about your genitals. And so there's passages that talk about covering and uncovering your feet. Um, so you, you leave it as it is and everybody goes, what's going on? Or thinks that you're just talking about you know, uncovering your feet. Or do you literally say what is going on? And offend everybody, right, or shock them, right, and you, you literally said what, what's, what's being talked about. Or do you find an equivalent expression, right? Adam made love to his wife, and she can see. Right? He went to relieve himself. Right? Do you say those kind of things and try to find that equivalent where people understand what's being said, but it's not the vulgar description of what's taking place. And so that's, that has to do with these translations. Of course, there is the issue of vocabulary. You know, it, it, again, that idea that it, it seems so simple. You just find an English word that replaces the Greek or the Hebrew. The problem becomes that there are words that have nuances in Greek that might not be encapsulated with an English word, or there are things connected with an English word that aren't necessarily in the original Greek. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm going to be reading from the, the King James here. All right, so beginning verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Not prevent them. And when you hear the word prevent, what do you think of? You're trying to stop something, right? You're trying to make sure that it doesn't happen. But that's not what it means. 
Right? And so that's why your translations will choose, choose the word proceed. Right? Will not proceed those that are asleep. Right? And so the dead in Christ will be risen first, and then we who are alive will also experience the resurrection. Right? And so we'll not precede those that have died. Which, at the time of the, the translation of the King James, prevents I had that connotation right, of preceding, preventing coming from the Latin, precede. Right? But today, prevent doesn't mean precede. It means to stop something. Right? And so words can change meaning. Sometimes there is there are nuances in the, the Greek and the English that, that aren't necessarily um, something to be carried over. And the same kind of thing goes with issues like grammar and, and syntax. How grammar is used in the syntax? I would some, I, I mean, I've heard people make uh, you know statements in a Bible class or in a sermon that because something is in the aorist tense in Greek, that means past complete action, and so such and such is the case. Uh, yeah, but the aorist can also be used for present type of things. Right? It can, in some situations, be used for ongoing types of things. To say, well, because it's errors, it is complete and it's past. Sometimes. In many cases. But there are exceptions. And, and so, the, the translators try to, to, try to do that as well. There's a thing called the historical present. And this is found throughout the Gospel of John, where it's in the present tense. But John is obviously, obviously talking about things that take, took place in the past. So when you translate it, do you put it in the present tense, or do you put it in the past tense? A couple examples of, of this. Make sure that we're not going to... Yeah, that's a good place to put it. Um, how many people have heard the argument about... Let, well, let's just turn there. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Uh, Post-resurrection uh, uh, encounter with Jesus. Uh, Peter and some of the other disciples are out on uh, out fishing. Jesus appears to them on shore. Uh, they recognize him. They come to come to Jesus. They have breakfast with him. And then Jesus pulls Peter aside to, to talk to him. Um, John chapter 21, beginning in verse uh, 15. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Now, how have you heard that verse? How have you heard this passage explained? What's going on in this passage, according to what you've heard people say? Um, Jesus is like setting up Peter to be like that. Uh, the bottom of the church and taught him to preach the word. Okay, so part of it is, I mean, that's, that's the main section here, is this, you know, that's, that's the, Peter is, is, is being uh, encouraged to, to take care of uh, Jesus' followers. But what's the, the idea about Jesus asking him three times about love? Okay. okay, there's that issue with the denial. Has nobody heard this one? The difference between agape and phileo? Okay. All right. I was, I was saying, I've heard this all my life. <laughs> so some people make the case that what Jesus is doing is saying, uh, is saying uh, using the word agape to talk about the love that he's asking Peter for, but Peter's responding with the what? Now, when, when you hear sermons or Bible classes, people talking about agape, how do they talk about it? What's agape? No, that's more of the, the second one, the what? Agape is about unconditional. 
Yes, it's the unconditional love, the godly love, the highest love. Right? There's different Greek words for love. And, and so what's going on here is, is you know, Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me with that godly love, unconditional love? Do you love me? And Peter's saying, Lord, I'm your friend. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I'm your friend. Peter, are you my friend? Yes, Lord, I'm your friend. So that's the way most people talk about this. Uh, you know, they, they make this case, right? There's, there's the Greek, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It sounds pretty acceptable. Sounds like it makes sense, and it, it helps us understand that passage. There's just a few things wrong with that. Let's look at First Samuel. Excuse me, Second Samuel, uh, chapter thirteen. Second Samuel chapter 13 talks about some of David's children, particularly uh, a man named Amnon and his half-sister Tamar. And Amnon is so consumed with lust for Tamar that he's convinced by a friend how he can get her into his bedchamber and then he will rape her. Right. And then once he's raped her, He's kind of disgusted with her, and, and so he makes it even worse, right? I and mean, it's bad enough that you that you sinned against her in this way. You've compounded that sin by not now getting her. But note what it says in verse one of Second Samuel thirteen. Now, Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar, and after time, Amnon, David's sister, David's son, loved her. When this is translated into the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the scriptures, and after a time, Amnon, David's son, David's son, adopted her. Now think how Amnon goes on to treat this woman. Does he agape Tamar? Absolutely not, but that's the word that's used. In fact, let's even go to John chapter 3. Verse 19. Right? We know 3.16 because it talks about the love that God has for the world. But John chapter 3, verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved agape, the darkness, rather than the light because their works were evil. So John doesn't even consistently use agape only to talk about the highest love you can possibly have, the godly love. And John doesn't even use it that way. So people will sometimes make this case, and it's, well, that's not exactly true. Have you ever heard this one? Right, while we're talking about issues with greed. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The word power is translated in Greek word dunamis, and from dunamis we get the word dynamite, so the gospel is God's dynamite. Have you heard that before? I actually have heard someone make that case in the sermon. Is the gospel God's dynamite? No, it's not. But what happened? Somebody made this connection. Yes, linguistically, Dunamis serves as the base for thousands of years to become dynamite. But when Paul writes dunamis, he does not have in mind that the gospel is God's dynamite. And so we have to be careful when we use the Greek and the Hebrew and these kinds of things with this. I mean, to, to do that would be to suggest that in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8, that, um, that we should be laughing while we give our means, our contributions. We should laugh, because God loves a hilarion gift. And hilarion isn't cheerful, it's hilarious, right? God loves a hilarious gift. Right. I, I had a Greek professor who made the point, and I don't know that he, I mean, he was wild to guess, but he said, 85% of the time, when I hear someone getting ready to make a comment, well, the Greek says, 85% of the time, what comes next is wrong. Right. So, 
always be careful with these issues because vocabulary and syntax don't have necessarily those equivalents in English and, and Greek. Right? And so we have to be careful with how we handle them. And so translators have to be, make sure that they handle that carefully as well. Questions or comments? Anything we need to do? So what does the, the conversation between Jesus and Peter mean? It's probably more more along the lines of what some people were suggesting about the three times. It's the fact that he's asking three times because he's demanding three times. Because people will make the point about the uh, the switching between agape and filet, but they don't make the point of like he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Right? And there's nobody nobody ever makes a sermon about you know why he keeps switching there. Uh, so it probably has more to the idea of, you know, he's giving him this opportunity to affirm his love for him. That, that sounds reasonable to me. Other questions? Comments? All right, let's turn to a couple other things that are important to keep in mind as we begin to think about biblical study, exegesis, we have to be careful of with and continuing with this idea of language. We need to be careful of, of how we approach language and the Bible because sometimes there are things said in the Bible that aren't meant to be understood as what we might literally think. And so we use figures of speech to get a point across. And of course the figure of speech isn't meant to be taken literally. So for example, if someone was to say, nobody said this, but if someone was to say, he was green with envy. The point isn't that he, a male person, was, the verb to be suggesting the past tense, uh, green, a color. Right? And so because of his envy, the man turned a greenish color. Well, that's not what the, mean, the phrase means, right? The idea is that he was very jealous. And so we use figures of speech to make language more interesting. But they can be difficult to understand if the reader is not careful. 